Good evening, I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, National Chair of A Women's Journey. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicine's A Women's Journey, thank you for joining us this evening for our monthly webcast series, Conversations That Matter. A Woman's Journey strives to improve your well-being through health education. Regardless of our health concerns, diet, exercise, and a healthy lifestyle always play a role. Tonight, we will learn the role lifestyle plays in our overall wellness and recommended strategies. I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Selvi Rajagopal, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. With a particular interest in women's and adolescent health, Dr. Raja practices at the Healthful Eating Activity and Weight Program. Following our conversation, Dr. Raja will respond to many of your questions, so please use the Q&A on your screen to pose a question throughout the evening. Our webcast will conclude this evening at 8 p.m. And tomorrow you'll receive an email asking you to complete a brief survey about this webcast. In the coming days, the video of tonight's live streams will be available on the A Women's Journey website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a women's journey under conversations that matter. I wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Johns Hopkins University's program, Hopkins at Home, for the production assistance. You can visit their website, Hopkins at Home, for additional lectures and courses throughout the year, such as a three-part series on mental health in women, which begins on May 18th. So many of us struggle to prevent and manage disease through healthy living, including exercise, other behaviors, and eating. So now I am pleased to begin tonight's conversation with Dr. Raja. Hi everyone, I uh, hope everyone's having a good evening. I'd like to welcome you to my home tonight um, for this presentation. And I'm really excited to share with you all some of the pearls um, of healthy living that I have come to understand as a clinician and as someone who works with patients, um, mostly um, adults, but some younger patients as well and the older adolescent age group um, to help them get to a healthier lifestyle, reach their weight goals if that's part of it and help to um, prevent and manage chronic disease. And so when we talk about, you know, what are the hallmarks of leading a healthy life? What does that mean, right? We, we have a lot of the um, evidence for this from really looking at populations around the world over time and looking to see, you know, what are different people around the world doing in terms of the way they eat, the way they move, what are their different risk factors, for living a average or above average life expectancy? And how can we relate that to you know, certain uh, markers of health? And then how do we make conclusions? And so um, just for example, you, know, you may have heard about something called the blue zones of the world. And these are different parts of the world. Um, uh, there's a place in Greece, um, there's a place in Japan, Okinawa, different places where we um, know there's people who live often over a hundred. And not only are they living over a hundred years, they're actually living pretty healthy uh, years over a hundred. And so we've sort of come to understand that certain aspects of their diet, certain aspects of their lifestyle seem to be contributing to that. And sort of those population studies, now we've gotten able to um, you know, drill down with uh, cellular biology, some of the actual mechanisms that drive this. And so when we talk about the hallmarks of healthy eating tonight, we're gonna focus on three major tenets. The first is gonna be nutrition. So how do we approach eating healthy? There's so much noise out there about what's good and what's not good. And so we'll talk about that, right? Um, and then we'll talk about, you know, what's the point of physical activity and movement in general. Um, and then lastly, we'll touch on stress because stress truly is a driver of health um, complications and managing stress is a really important part of preventing those complications um, and just sort of getting things back into control and improving our overall quality of life. So these are the three main things we're going to discuss tonight. So before we launch into these three tenants, I would like to define 
for everyone this term of, you know, what is a normal weight, what is overweight and what is obese, right? And the reason I want to define this is because this is something that I um, use, you know, within my practice as a guide for figuring out, you know, where someone's starting off from their weight uh, baseline. And then we sort of figure out goals depending on what's going on with their health. So this is where I want to begin. When we talk about weight, we have different qualifiers, right? Because everyone has a different level of what's normal or what is, you know, an ideal weight for them. Um, however, we have come to have these sort of um, indices, right? These body mass index or BMI that you may have heard about. And how did these thresholds come about, right? I want to sort of give you a background on this. Many studies have been done both in the United States and around the world, looking again at what happens to people when their weight um, relative to their body surface area, so their BMI, what happens when they cross a certain threshold. And one of the largest studies, um, the Framingham Heart Study, which took place in a town called Framingham, Massachusetts, um, and it's, this study was started several decades ago, back in the 60s, and they, they followed over 6,000 adults over a period of 24 years. And they looked at these adults' lifestyles, they looked at their different um, health conditions, they looked at different you know, sexes, male, female. So it was a really good quality study where they followed people for many years. And what they learned is that it seemed to be that there was a threshold of this body mass index of about 30, where people started to actually lose years of life expectancy. And that risk seemed to get even higher when people got above that 35 uh, BMI threshold. And that's where that number, those numbers came from for us to, you know, sort of define risks for uh, not only, you know, premature mortality, but also then getting deeper into it, some of the conditions that predispose people to dying early. So in this study, they were also able to figure out that, okay, people were dying earlier at these higher thresholds of, you know, relative weight to body surface area or BMI, but then the reasons that people were dying tended to be linked with certain conditions. Now, these conditions were mostly cardiovascular disease, risk factors found to be things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, you know, type two diabetes, and then also cancer. And so that study really is a landmark study. It has helped to inform our understanding of what it means to really help someone in, in, you know, in prolonging their life to be healthy and, you know, lengthy and, um, and what are the sort of risk factors and warning signs when someone's headed down a road that might limit those things. And so that, you know, again, is just one piece of the equation in understanding, you know, someone's health, right? So you might have, you know, a certain weight that puts you in this category of 30 or above BMI, and someone might say, oh, you're obese. But then that really doesn't tell you the whole story. Because, you know, say you've been an athlete your whole life, and you have a lot of muscle mass, right? Just having your weight to your surface area in a certain, you know, level doesn't mean that, you know, you're really unhealthy. There's a lot of qualifiers that go into that. And so one of the other qualifiers we use is something called a waist circumference. Now the waist circumference has become a very useful tool for us because it uh, measures the circumference of um, excess tissue or adipose tissue or fat that you may be carrying around your midsection. What we know is that the fat that tends to accumulate around your midsection tends to be linked with the type of fat that actually ends up wrapping around your organs. This is called visceral fatty tissue or visceral adipose tissue. And this is the type of fat that seems to promulgate or make a plaque buildup happen. Or, and then it also relates to conditions such as diabetes and insulin resistance and cholesterol and things like that. So that's a type of fat that we know is not very good for heart health and not good for longevity. This is opposed to the fat that we may accumulate, you know, in our thighs, you know, you know, extremities, which is more of the subcutaneous fat. And so I think pairing the waist circumference with the body mass index gives you a bit more information to be able to say, okay, all right, put on a few pounds this past year, but it has most of this, you know, weight been in my midsection. Okay, that has happened. Maybe I'm, you know, getting into a zone of health risk that I need to take a closer look. Then obviously you can go and talk to your doctor and get lab work and figure out what are your risks. There's also something called body composition, right? There are body composition analyzers and many fancy tools to do that, such as getting a DEXA scan or an MRI or a bioimpedance analyzer, lots of different tools that basically will be a little bit more information to tell you how much of your body mass is actually water mass, 
you know, muscle mass or fat mass, right? There's different types of mass we have, and then bone mass. So that helps differentiate what's actually within your body to tell you, okay, this is how much of my weight equals this. So all of these different qualifiers can come into the equation for you to first understand where is my health right now. But say you figured out that, okay, I've gotten to a point where maybe I put on the COVID-15, right? I've put on some weight this past year and most of it's in my midsection. I have a family history of, you know, type two diabetes and my uncle had a heart attack when he was, you know, 60 and, you know, I'm 45. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go that route. Then I think it's a good, good idea to take a look at your lifestyle and say, well, are there things I can do to improve that and to prevent that risk? And the first thing that we really need to think about once we've identified that, okay, maybe, you know, my weight's going in a direction that's not helpful for my um, overall, you know, quality of life long-term, then you got to figure out what is your individual body's energy needs. Because when we talk about achieving health and we talk about achieving a healthy weight, energy balance is really very important to understand. Each of us has a unique resting metabolism. This resting metabolism concept means that even at rest, if you were just lying in bed all day, your body requires a certain number of calories just to sustain you at a cellular level to keep everything going. And then you have to add into that the amount of calories and energy that your body requires in order to maintain your activities. If you're doing, you know, some sort of sport activity, just, you know, eating requires energy for digestion. There's so many things we do that actually burn energy. And so each of us, based on our genetics, based on how much muscle mass we have, based on whatever health conditions we have, medications we're on, there's so many different factors, right? Phase of life that we're in, based on all these different factors, we have a unique resting metabolism. But how do you figure out what's your resting metabolism, right? We're not just walking around knowing these things. There are some mathematical equations and calculations that have been created that you could go online, Google and look up. Also, I think that there's a couple of other tools that may be more helpful. One that if you have access to, you could get, if you really wanted to do this, is you could look up, there's a few centers, our, our clinic does this. There um, is a machine um, that actually does a, something called an indirect calorimetry measurement. Now, this is basically about a 10 to 15 minute procedure where you sit down, you blow into a valve, a one-way valve, and it measures your body's oxygen consumption at a cellular level. And that puts out a number equivalent to how many calories your body basically needs in a day at rest. That's your resting metabolism. You can use that information as a marker to say, okay, in a 24 hour period, my body needs about 1300 calories. And then you sort of figure out, okay, in order to lose weight, I probably need to achieve somewhat of an energy balance deficit, right? Compared to whatever it is that I'm eating in calories right now. And so you could get really nitty gritty into the calculations here and say in a week, I want to lose a certain number of pounds. And so theoretically in a week, if, you know, 3,500 calories equals a pound, if I subtract 500 calories a day, that equals a pound. I'm giving you this, just, this is the theoretical framework that is often used. Um, and, you know, even by, you know, weight management experts to help people lose weight. But I think there's a lot of nuance here because everybody's body is going to behave differently. And so this equation may not work perfectly for every person. So I think an even better tool and one that's actually been studied and proven to be very effective for helping to promote weight loss and actually help people to maintain a good weight loss or weight, uh, healthy weight once they reach it is actually nutritional tracking. So there's multiple apps and, you know, uh, website applications that have been created um, that now allow people to input everything they eat and drink. Um, into these, these applications that then put out a certain amount of calories per item of food, per drink. It shows you, you know, the macronutrient profile. So you really get to learn about what you're eating. In addition to that, in a period of 24 hours, you can see everything that you're eating. What does it add up to? So this is going to tell you without doing any fancy testing in a day, this is what I eat. And I would suggest that for the individual, like that 45 year old person that I was talking about is trying to lose a few pounds. Maybe take a week or two and just put everything you eat and drink into this app. And then in that, you know, two week period, you're going to see every day on average, this is how much I consume. And then you should check your weight, maybe a couple of times each week. If your weight goes up, then you know that maybe I'm eating a little bit more than my body's natural energy balance or energy requirements. So maybe I'm trying to lose weight. I could cut back. You can just start by cutting back by maybe about 200 to, you know, 300 calories and see how you feel. 
Um, and that should achieve about a half a pound of weight loss a week for the average person. Okay. And the other thing is, if you notice your tracking and your weight is staying the same, then, you know, this is where my body seems to be in its homeostasis. It's balanced. It's, I'm not going to go up or down. If you start to lose weight, you know, at whatever you're eating, then, you know, okay, I'm eating in such a way that my body seems to be, you know, using, um, you know, using more calories than I'm intaking. So I'm going to lose weight. So you sort of figure that out, you know, without having to do fancy testing, just using these apps. And I have plenty of patients who have come to my clinic and they've already used such apps and they have some really good baseline data that we then work off of and build a plan together. So now that we've sort of gone over, you know, what does it mean to have a certain weight? How do you qualify that within the context of body composition and then energy balance, right? We're going to talk about this nutrition piece. I really want to make it clear. Nutrition to me is the primary driver of weight change. So you have physical activity, you have these other things, but nutrition, what you're intaking from an energy standpoint is going to be the primary driver of changing weight. Okay. And so how do we approach nutrition? Because it really is complex, right? Not only what you eat matters, but how much you eat and when you eat matter, all three of these things, right. Should be in a certain framework that's going to meet your health goals. And so when we talk about what, right, where's the evidence behind what to eat? I first want to just mention that there's a diet that probably has had the most evidence in terms of good quality studies. And what I mean by good quality studies is there is not only observational data of following people, you know, over a number of years on a certain diet to see, you know, what happens, but also there's controlled studies where people are actually specifically placed on the intervention, which may be the diet versus a placebo, and they're actually followed and seeing what happens. And so we've had both types of data repeated over and over and over again for thousands of people. And this, this diet is known as the Mediterranean diet. Now, I don't really like the word diet in general, because diet to me means short term fix. I really like the idea of saying, okay, let's look at what this Mediterranean diet intervention is that's been studied. And let's figure out what elements of it are actually adaptable or helpful for me, if there's a lot of data behind it. And so what is the Mediterranean diet, right? It's, it's a diet that focuses on minimally processed, mostly plant-based foods, such as fruits and vegetables and whole grains, also nuts and legumes, which are, you know, beans. And then it also really prioritizes particularly mon and saturated fat. And this is different than saturated fat. And so monounsaturated fat is going to come from some oils like olive oil, avocados or avocado oil, grapeseed oil, nuts, seeds, these are all examples. And then you're gonna limit the foods in this diet that have more saturated fat. And now where does saturated fat come from? Saturated fat comes mostly from animal products, um, such as especially the fattier cuts of meat, um, like a ribeye, um, or you know maybe whole milk, butter, dairy products. And a lot of the science behind this comes from, again, looking at a cellular level, at what different components of these foods do to different pathways in the body. Because what we have come to understand is that, you know, when we consume things over a long period of time and, you know, we can, you know, we accumulate a certain amount of it, um, our body adapts to it in some different ways. And so if you accumulate a, a lot of saturated fat over a certain period of time, we seem to have data that shows that it can negatively impact your cholesterol. Similarly, we've seen that if somebody, um, you know, tends to eat a diet that includes things like modern saturated fats, so still fats, but a different type of fat, it tends to downregulate some of the inflammatory pathways that can lead to plaque buildup. And so the benefits of the Mediterranean diet have been shown um, for heart disease, for diabetes, for high blood pressure, for cholesterol, and even for, you know, cognition and dementia. So there's a lot of wide reaching benefits um, for people when they do follow a Mediterranean diet, but it's not the only approach that you can take or need to take in order to get health benefits. Again, I think what's going to matter the most when you're determining what and how to eat is what's gonna make sense for you, your food preferences, your lifestyle. But I think knowing these sort of background concepts may help to educate how you adapt it into your life. We do wanna to touch on the fact that there have been a number of more macronutrient focused diets. Um, examples would be things like the low carbohydrate plans, such as the keto diet and the Atkins diet. 
Now the keto diet, um, a lot of people have heard about and it preferences having higher fat intake. It doesn't specify whether it's, you know, which type of fat, because there are different types of fat, as I just mentioned, uh, but it says a higher fat intake and a very low carbohydrate intake, usually less than 30 grams, less than 20 grams a day. And this, you know, has been shown to be beneficial for short term weight loss, um, about four weeks. And after that four week time frame, it seems that most people in the studies that have been done seem to fall off because it is rather restrictive. Um, and uh, and it's, it's a little bit hard to adapt into everyday living for people long term. We also don't know what the long term effects are for overall cardiovascular health. Um, and we have a bit of mixed data about how it affects cholesterol, but it can help if you know you are dealing with type two diabetes, having lower carbohydrates certainly can help with some of the insulin resistance and things. So there are some benefits. We have some short-term data, but not really long-term stuff. And then with, uh, with Atkins, it's more of a high protein, low carb diet. So that's another example. Again, short-term weight loss benefits, not necessarily uh, having the evidence uh, as the Mediterranean diet has, for example, for some of these bigger outcomes. Um, and then there's, you know, other more specific diets that, you know, your, your prescriber, your provider may tell you about like the DASH diet, which has been studied to be very effective for high blood pressure lowering. So there's all these different diets that are out there. And again, as I said, you know, I think you need to figure out, okay, what's my health status? What are the things I'm working to improve? Is it blood sugar? Is it cholesterol? Is it blood pressure? Talk with your healthcare provider, maybe a registered dietitian and figure out what are the components that are going to make the most sense for me. And then once you've figured out what, then you have to figure out how much, right? I already sort of mentioned, you can use a calorie tracking app to sort of figure out maybe this is where from an energy standpoint, I need to be to reach, you know, some amount of weight loss, but you can also use a much more simplified approach if you don't want to do any of that. And I want to draw your attention to something that I love to show my patients. And I try to use in my own life. It's, it's called the healthy eating plate guide. So this image right here is I think a beautiful picture that you can easily, you know, adapt into your mind. You can print it out and put it on your fridge, show the whole family. So everyone has a reminder, but I really like how this plate splits up your, your, you know, portioning of different foods on your plate. The idea here is that without having to weigh or measure anything or calorie count, if you just look at your plate, your bowl, whatever it is you're eating, whether you're eating out at a restaurant, you're getting takeout, or you're at home, right? You can take this plate and divide it into these different quad, you know, the, the two quadrants on the right and then that one half. Half of the plate has lots of color, has vegetables. And when we look at the types of vegetables, it actually is quite specific. It shows you some vegetables that have good quality fiber in it. It's not just all corn. It's not just all white potatoes. It's got, you know, all different things in there. There's broccoli and carrots and peas. So really that variety and having half of the plate be consistent of that is going to be great. It's going to give you lots of good vitamins and minerals, um, but it's also not going to give you all, you know, a ton of calories because these foods just don't carry a lot of calories. And then the other half of the plate can be split between lean proteins, which you see on the upper right side, and lean, lean protein examples are beautifully demonstrated there. Examples would be, you know, salmon, and you have poultry, you have beans, nuts, tofu, Greek yogurt, lentils, all different types of foods. Then in that bottom quadrant, you see whole grains, right? So whole grain carbohydrates. So there's lots of different carbohydrates out there and carbohydrates seem to get the bad end of the stick these days. And, you know, it's, it seems that people think they can only lose weight if they cut out carbohydrates, but in reality, you really can lose weight and achieve a healthy weight and maintain that healthy weight eating carbohydrates, but just being very smart and savvy about the choice of carbohydrates. So I really encourage my patients to look at nutrition labels and to look for something called fiber when they're choosing carbohydrates. And that will be your quick you know, sort of guide to, okay, is this going to actually be a good carbohydrate or maybe something less helpful to me? And so examples of good carbohydrates in this picture are whole wheat bread, quinoa, brown rice, and whole wheat pasta. Okay. So before I go on into the when category, I want to quickly talk a little bit more about the carbohydrate concept. So why is it that having fiber and carbohydrates is important? So fiber is something that you've probably heard about. <laughs> 
And fiber comes from plants, right? It comes from plants that, and it's a property, it's a, it's a type of, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a type of substance that our bodies actually don't fully absorb. And there's different types of fiber, soluble and insoluble, but we, we need both. And fiber's role is not only to help give bulk to your stools and move things along, but actually it delays the absorption of carbohydrates into the bloodstream. What does that mean for you? It means that when you eat um, a bowl of cereal, for example, or if you have a bowl of oatmeal, the more fiber in that bowl, the slower you're gonna see your blood sugar go up and the more even your blood sugar will be after the meal. And then it also affects how your cholesterol gets metabolized. So it's actually been shown that whole grains, believe it or not, are linked with lowering of cholesterol and they can be helpful in maintaining healthier blood sugar levels, even if you have diabetes, right? So again, carbohydrates aren't the devil here. It's just being choosy about what kinds. So that's my quick, you know, sort of quick guide to how do you portion control for a healthy weight and healthy life overall. Once you've figured out the what, the how much, the when does matter, okay? So, when do we eat, right? It's good to eat in general throughout the day. Um, I don't usually advocate that people, you know, necessarily skip a meal in order to lose weight, but there are different approaches here as well. You know, I know that people often, um, you know, dip into this intermittent fasting or different types of, you know, um, fasted states and intermittent fasting itself. There's three different types you can do the, the alternate day fasting, the five, two fasting or the time restricted. And we can certainly go into this at the end of the talk. If you know, people have questions about it, perhaps the most popular type is time restricted eating where you pick an interval during the day where you're just going to eat during that interval. Um, and then you don't eat around those hours. The actually the science behind intermittent fasting and why it, it can be helpful is this whole idea of how do we store calories when we eat them? Let me take a sip of water. <laughs> All right, so um, the whole idea of storage of calories, right? And so our bodies, we all have this thing called a circadian rhythm, right? Or a day or night cycle. It's an independent 24 hour mechanism that determines when our cells are awake and when they wanna be asleep. Within that cellular, you know, sort of environment, there are hormones and chemicals that get released at varying amounts, depending on what part of that cycle you're in. So in the morning, for example, we all have higher stress hormone levels, but we also are uh, much better with glucose regulation. So we have lower levels of insulin production during the morning hours compared to in the evening hours. And this applies, this concept generally applies to people, whether or not you're a diabetic a pre-diabetic or a non-diabetic, most of us, okay, produce less insulin per unit of carbohydrate intake in the morning compared to in the evening. Because in the morning, in the daytime, our bodies, maybe evolutionarily, are designed to be awake, to feed our brain, to feed our muscles for activity. So it's not going to store what we eat as much. But later in the day, you know, if you eat most of your calories, especially later in the day, your body is actually primed to start to go get ready for bed and get, you know, go to sleep, get its rest. And so it actually tends to kick out more insulin in response to carbohydrates later in the day. When it's kicking out more insulin, the whole job of insulin is really to store these, um, this energy for later use. So while it's trying to protect you and store this energy, you can often end up seeing this reflected as weight gain. And so I usually will tell my patients, you know, try not to eat after eight o'clock and try to keep, you know, whether or not you're doing a time restricted eating approach or not, make sure you're eating and filling yourself up to the point that you're not having all your calories at dinner and that you can make good choices at dinner. And, um, you know, if that's the time of day, you want to have less carbs, totally fine, you know, because maybe that would help you lose a little weight, but you don't, again, need to eliminate any one thing and you don't need to do very restricted timing either to lose weight. And the studies we have shown, we've done meta-analyses or we review a bunch of studies. We haven't seen that, you know, doing intermittent fasting results in greater weight loss than people who just eat, you know, a bit more mindfully and lower their calories according to what their needs are. And so, so that's the sort of summary for nutrition. That's the what, the how much, and the when. And so now we move on to physical activity. What's the role of physical activity? So physical activity, I use the word physical activity rather than exercise, because I think movement in general is what we know matters, right? So standing and walking and doing activities rather than sitting, you don't have to be out there running a marathon in order to be a healthy person. You really don't. Walking is great. Any activity is better than none. 
And what we know specifically when it comes to things like heart disease prevention or disease control is that a specific type of activity, right? A specific type of activity that gets your heart rate into at least a moderate intensity zone. Um, and I'll give you, you know, sort of an example of what this is like, but getting your level of intensity up to a moderate intensity and doing that um, over, you know, a certain period of minutes per day um, the, the recommendation from the American Heart Association is a total of 150 minutes a week. So if you want to think about it, you know, three days of 50 minutes or however you want to split it up, doing that is what's the minimum sort of requirement um, or recommendation to maintain heart health. And I would say if you're starting from scratch, you're not going to get to 150 minutes per week in a day or a month, maybe just start with 10 minutes. The 10 minutes is the minimum to just get some of the benefits going. But in that 10 minutes, if you're walking, if you're jogging, if you're on an elliptical, it doesn't matter. Try to get to the point of effort where you can't carry a casual conversation. That's what I always tell my patients because that's gonna give you a very quick sense of how hard you're working and whether you're really truly exercising your heart muscle. If you're able to carry a casual conversation, you're probably not gonna get quite as many of the benefits. So you can do 150 minutes a week as a goal. Um, if you don't have time for 150 minutes, but you are already engaged in some sort of activity or exercise that you like, maybe it's tennis or maybe it's swimming, whatever. These might be a little bit more vigorous intensity activities where you're really not even able to get a couple of sentences out while you're doing it. You're really working. So you might only be able to get one or two words. This is considered high intensity or vigorous intensity activity. You only need 75 minutes of this level of activity per week, according to the American Heart Association, to get the cardiovascular health benefits. So you can figure out what works for you based on your lifestyle. There is no one size fits all perfect for you, but this would be a very good general guideline to sort of think about from the cardiovascular exercise side of things. But in addition to doing cardio aerobic exercise, which is very good for, you know, again, heart disease reduction, cholesterol lowering, blood pressure, diabetes, all these things. It's also really helpful to include resistance training or resistance exercises. Resistance exercises just means you're lifting something against gravity, lifting something against, you know, weight, and you're, you know, at the very micro level, getting your muscles activated. And so why is resistance exercise important? So resistance exercises have been shown um, to actually boost metabolism more than doing just cardio and aerobic exercise. And the reason for that is because in resistance training, as I said, you're activating muscle groups. And when you activate and strengthen or accrue more muscle cells, your body actually starts to burn more energy at rest because muscle cells require more energy than any other type of cell. And so having a bit more lean muscle mass combined with having your heart muscle worked through cardiovascular exercise is going to be the name of the game. So 150 minutes a week or 75 minutes of more harder intensity, you know, cardiovascular exercise plus resistance training of your choice. It can be free weights. It can be using resistance bands, whatever you like doing that about two times a week as a goal would be a good minimum. Um, and just doing that and balancing it to your schedule. Now, all of this, I know sounds like that's all great, you know, on paper and it's wonderful, but again, you figure out where you are as a starting, as a starting line, and then figure out how to slowly get into it over time. And it's really nice to, I think, choose chunks of time, like a month as a goal, and then go to the next month, et cetera. And so now that we've talked about nutrition and physical activity, I do want to also underscore that the physical activity piece is important for not just, you know, when you're trying to lose weight or when you're trying to, you know, control uh, blood sugar and things like that. But as you lose weight, your body actually is going to slow down its metabolism naturally, because if you think about it, there's less mass to support. If you've lost some of your mass, right? You've lost some body weight. And so when your metabolism slows down, probably one of the most effective ways to maintain your metabolism is to keep active and especially to activate those muscle cells. And so that's, I think, where physical activity becomes really important is that weight maintenance, healthy weight maintenance, so that you don't then regain the weight you've lost. So you really think about them in this sort of, um, in this sort of a framework. And I think the benefits of physical activity reach beyond you know, weight alone. They, to me, reach to this level of stress management, which is this third tenant that I mentioned at the beginning. What we know is that again, at a micro level, stress seems to impact pathways of inflammation in our body. 
that over time tend to drive these things like insulin resistance and plaque buildup and blood pressure and stuff. And there's really good studies that again, show this. And so we've come to understand that it's very important to be, you know, really cognizant of what are the stressors in your life? What are the things that are triggers for you to have unhealthy habits and to then figure out a strategy, a mental map of how you're going to get ahead of that stress before it builds, you know, beyond control. And the science behind it, beyond the cellular mechanisms that I've highlighted, is that we ourselves, everyone produces cortisol, which is a stress hormone in response to stress. We reproduce this hormone in response to external stress, if it's a lion chasing you, and to internal stress, if you are anxious about something. And so knowing that we produce this hormone, right, it's important to understand what's its role. So it's there to protect us, right? But it's also has side effects. The side effects of having increased cortisol are that your blood pressure goes up, your blood sugar levels go up, and your appetite can go up. And so if you think about it, it's the perfect storm for weight gain or, you know, poor health. If all of these things are happening simultaneously, you're stressed out, so your blood pressure goes up, you're stressed out, so you eat more, then your body's kicking out more glucose molecules, so you're storing more energy. All of this stuff is just a bad recipe. So we really need to have an idea of how to tackle the stress before it gets the better of us, right? So I usually will say to my patients, figure out, you know, okay, what are the things that stress you out? And then let's talk about some of the things that you know can de-stress you in that moment. Maybe it's taking a deep breath, getting some oxygen to your brain. Maybe it's taking a short walk. Maybe it's just turning off your, you know, Zoom meeting for half a minute. Whatever you need to do to de-stress you and bring you back down, um, that's going to make a huge difference for allowing you to make good decisions and for allowing you to hit the reset button and for lowering that stress hormone. And I think it's really important to have that plan. Um, and some of the specific things that have been studied to actually lower this sort of stress hormone and, and actually increase what we call the vagus nerve signaling. So vagus nerve is kind of doing the opposite of cortisol. It's a calm down nerve. It slows down your heart rate. It slows everything down, tells your brain I'm safe. I'm okay. Ways to actually increase that or, you know, deep breathing. I mentioned, um, if you like meditation, that's great. Doing something like a yoga practice. These are all methods that actually have been studied and proven to help stimulate that vagus nerve. So they have some far reaching benefits if you sort of get into the practice of it. So now that we've sort of hit on all of these three tenants that I think are very important to consider if you're trying to you know, get into a healthy lifestyle, you know, what's the other big thing? I think it's really important to garner the support of those who are close to you and a support system because it's hard for us to do these things without support, without accountability. And so I always say, figure out who, you know, who do you live with? Who are the people that are important to you and that influence your day-to-day -day life? Have the conversation with them that I want to actually make these changes. So they help keep you accountable and they make the process easier. Because a lot of times we assume that other people don't want us to make certain changes and are going to get in our way. But if we just have the conversation with them, most people, you know, you're close to, they care about you. So you can surely, you know, negotiate ways of making your you know, your home environment, your work environment, whatever it is easier. And so that you'll be more successful with your plans. And so I would say that that's where I'll, I'll leave it off. But I think again, think through, you know, there's three different things, nutrition, physical activity, and stress. They're not all going to be perfect alignment all the time, but I do think just trying to think through that, you know, there's some actual science that's been, you know, put together from years and years of research of these different things. And maybe I can just take elements and maybe I can just work on one thing this one month. And then once it's, you know, I've mastered it, it's really become part of my lifestyle and it's no longer a foreign concept. Right. And I, and I also want to leave you with one more thought you know, a lot of people will come to me and will say, well, I, you know, I can't do this, or I only like this. And I always like, you know, to have to remind myself and them that, you know, what, none of us was born with only one preference. These are all learned preferences, whether it's your way of eating, your way of sleeping, your way of doing things. So they're learned preferences. So we can retrain our brains as well. And there's again, science behind that. We know that it takes maybe about two or three weeks to start to form these, you know, repeated patterns to form brain connections and form new habits. And that's how you develop a lifestyle rather than something that's just a short-term fix. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Really wonderful information and lots of questions coming forward. But before we get started with our audience, I've got a couple that I'd like to ask you first. Um, number one, you spoke about your clinic. Mm -hmm. um, if someone's interested in coming to your clinic, um, how, how do they go about that? 
Yeah, so there's a couple of ways. Our clinic is actually, um, you know, you can, if you decide that you have a specific health goal that may be tied into weight, I think that that's the first question. Um, and if that's the case, then, you know, you don't have to be in a specific weight category. You don't have to have any particular medical, you know, complication necessarily because of your weight. If you think you're in a path of unhealthy weight gain, as I've defined it for you earlier, I think that would be sort of the first question. You, def- you figure that out. You can either self-refer yourself by, you know, calling the number and we have a website that again, I'm happy to share the link to, but there's a website you can go to the phone number for the clinic and you can just call um, and then make an appointment to see one of us. There's um, six of us who are actually obesity medicine um, uh, board certified providers in the practice. And, um, and then if you also want to just talk it over with your primary care doctor or you know, your subspecialty doctor, they can also make a referral for you. Great. Wonderful. Well, let's get started then with the questions from the viewers. So the first question is from Rachel. Uh, Dr. Raja, what are micronutrients and how much of them do we need to consume? Yeah. So I probably should have uh, mentioned what that is. I apologize. Micronutrients is a fancy way of saying vitamins and minerals. And so, um, you know, there are vitamins and minerals that our body, uh, you know, requires from the foods that we eat. Um, and, uh, so we're, we're only going to get them if we include them in our diet. And if we don't include them, then, you know, we're going to be deficient in them. Example of a vitamin would be something like vitamin A, um, vitamin D, and then, you know, example of the mineral would be something like iron or zinc. And so again, if you eat most food groups, you're probably getting most of it. But if you tend to only eat food that's in boxes, without the fruits and vegetables, you may not get quite as many of them. So about that though, if you're taking vitamins or, or supplements, yeah, um, and is there particular times uh, that you should take them, you know, as opposed to just, you know, taking them all at once or, or maybe you shouldn't take them after you're, you've eaten a certain food or even with your own medications that you might be taking, you know, perhaps interaction with them. So how would someone go about that to um, avoid some of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I will say off the bat, if you are someone that doesn't have a diagnosed, um, you know, gut absorption, malabsorption issue, like you don't have, you haven't had bowel surgery, you have a baseline, you're not struggling with chronic diarrhea or things like that. By and large, if you're eating again, fruits, vegetables, proteins in your diet, you're having all these different things you're gonna have most of the vitamins and minerals already in your food to where you really don't need to have a supplement of any sort. But if you have a specific health indication, so say your doctor tells you maybe every month you have heavy periods and you become a little iron deficient, right? You have anemia or something, then you can take an iron supplement. With an iron supplement, it's important to understand that it does interact. Um, there are you know, other vitamins, believe it or not, calcium, magnesium are two examples. They actually interact with the absorption of iron and make it a little harder for you to absorb it. So you're not gonna get the benefit of actually taking the supplement if you pair it with you know, foods that contain that. But how are you gonna know which foods contain it, right? So in general, I would say try to separate iron from your meals and just take it on its own by at least a couple of hours. That's the main, um, I would say supplement that requires the separation. Most other vitamins and minerals, you know, they can be taken together in one supplement. Um, but I think again, going down into which specific ones you need, it's going to be a discussion with your uh, doctor, depending on, you know, what, you know, specific symptoms you have, what lab, what your labs show, But most people walking around, if you're eating healthy and you're feeling mostly fine, you're not struggling with chronic fatigue, you're not struggling with different, very specific symptoms, you're probably not deficient, you're probably okay. Right. So I I think the bottom line with that is that, you know, ask your physician, your personal physician, because they know what medications you're on and, and they, you know, discuss the supplements. Because I think a lot of people sometimes forget to write down when they say, what medications are you taking? Very good point. Yeah. And supplements and vitamins are considered the medication. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's really important actually. Yes, you're right to tell your doctor exactly which supplements you're taking. And even if it's, you know, something like ginseng or something, right. Something that's not uh, like a vitamin, because a lot of these things that are sold over the counter, um, you know, they're not regulated by the food and drug administration. They don't have 
they're called supplements. They're not actually have nutrition labels. And so they're not, they're not, they're not regulated. And so they may have actually though, these additional compounds and things that can be harmful to you and it can be harmful to your organs. And so it's important for your doctor to be aware of it and to know how it interacts with your health conditions and your medications that you may be taking. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next question is from Stella. Mm -hmm. And she'd like to know when you are recovering from surgery or an illness, is it, is it important to eat more protein and why? Yeah, yeah, I would say that's true. Um, when you're recovering from an illness and when you're recovering from surgery, these are both times of stress for your body. So your body is actively trying to regenerate cells, depending on, you know, if you had a surgery, if you were hospitalized for a number of days, there's quite a bit of deconditioning and loss of muscle mass that can occur in a very short time frame. And so I think that prioritizing really good quality food in your diet is makes a lot of sense and prioritizing protein makes sense. Now, when it comes to prioritizing protein, this is a very common question I get, how much protein, right? Should I be eating only protein all day long? <laughs> the reality of it is our bodies can only digest a certain amount of protein at a particular time. That's about 30 grams. After that, you know, we're not doing a whole lot with the excess protein that we're consuming. Our kidneys are just going to be forced to try to filter it, which makes it harder on them. So I would say, again, this is another thing that you should discuss with your healthcare provider, depending on what your weight is, what, you know, your body composition is, what particular situation you're in, you know, what sort of illness or thing you're recovering from. And then you guys can figure out, you know, what's a good approach for me. If you want to have a quick fix sort of number in your head, the recommendation is going to be 0.8 um, grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. And I know that we in the U.S. don't really use kilograms, but um, but that's the way that the guidelines have been set for a recommended protein amount in a day. So you can calculate your weight by taking it and dividing it by 2.2. It gives you your weight in pounds and then just times it by 0.8. It's a little bit less than a pound, basically, uh, of, or it's a little bit less than one gram of protein per um, kilogram of body weight. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. Great. Yeah, I would think after surgery, you'd have to kind of ease your way back into protein. This is a yeah, I mean, you don't want to have like, yeah, you don't want to necessarily go again, go to town and have steak at every meal or something. Okay. I think, <laughs> I think starting off actually with a, something like a protein shake, it might be one of the easiest ways to ease back in or eggs, which are easily digestible protein shakes tend to be sort of pared down, you know, nutrients into one consolidated form. That's an, a liquid. So it's a little bit easier to get through your system. Um, but I, yeah, I, I like eggs as a great source of protein that are just very easy to digest on easy on the stomach and they're, they're, they're a whole protein. So, so yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next question uh, is from Rosie and she it's a great question. Is it better to exercise before or after you eat? I love this question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So there's, a, there's actually uh, two answers to this. It depends on what your goals are. So if you are a ultra endurance athlete, <laughs> you're training for a very long hundred mile race, which I don't know if this person is or not, um, then there may be some benefit for you <laughs> to actually exercise in a start in a, in a fasted state, because you're teaching your body to use fat stores for energy. Mm -hmm. Our body's preferred source, however, okay, our body's preferred source for energy is glucose and is glycogen. So glucose is the immediate simple sugar molecule that gets absorbed from food. And uh, glycogen is how that glucose is stored. It's a bunch of sugar molecules together. And those sit in our muscle cells by and large. And so our bodies and our muscles rely on that to fuel your activity. So if you think about it, you know, depending on what length of activity you're doing and what effort you're going at. Um, you know, if you're going at a fasted state just to go for a walk for 30 minutes, you're probably not asking a ton of your muscles, right? Your muscles are going to be okay dealing with the glycogen stores that you already have, because we all have a certain amount of glycogen stores. And typically our glycogen stores can go for about 90 minutes before they get depleted. Okay. So this is that carbohydrates and eating. If you're having a workout that's either very intense where you're getting your heart rate up into that 80, 80 for 5% of maximal, or you can't talk during it, you're running um, and you're doing it for about an hour or more, then I would say you might run up against some muscle fatigue from really burning through all that glycogen and your performance may suffer. Your ability to get through your workout may suffer. And so then you're not going to benefit quite as much. So I don't necessarily think, first of all, you have to work out in a fasted state in order to lose weight, if that's the question. And I don't think you have to work out in a fasted state in order to 
improve your cholesterol, your diabetes, et cetera. Um, I think it more depends on what your workout goals are. <laughs> right. Good point. Do, mm -hmm. Also though, on that, on that note. So if you didn't eat before. Yeah. So how soon should you eat afterwards? Because After. sometimes people go, you know, for hours and yeah. I'm sure that that's detrimental to, uh, on, on yeah. aspect of your health there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I would say, try not to go more than two hours. Try not to go more than two hours. Again, if you're somebody that is training for a marathon and I, you know, try to go on, you're really doing some hard work, then I think, um, you know, you're probably requiring a lot more of your muscles and they are going to be much happier and able to be rebuilt a lot faster. Um, if you feed them a bit sooner, um, with, um, you know, both carbohydrates and protein within a span of 30 minutes to an hour. But, you know, again, life happens, you're busy, you're running around, just try to get something in your system with some carbs and some protein and some good hydration with water within two hours, you'll be good. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Raja, the next question is from Carol. Have diets other than the Mediterranean diet been studied about their ability to reduce inflammation? Yeah, so I don't think there's a diet out there that's actually been studied with quite a, the same amount of evidence. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there really isn't even one micronutrient or macronutrient, anything that's been studied to single handedly be the tool for lowering inflammation. In fact, you could be on the Mediterranean diet and still have inflammation if you have uncontrolled stress in your life. So all of this is within context. And so that's why I liked, I really wanted to underscore that with the diet, again, it's just I like to say it's an approach to eating that includes prioritizes certain foods. And if you overall try to include more of those foods in your diet, and then just sort of fit it in line with what your weight goals are and the timing of your eating and how much you're going to probably reach a better state overall with inflammation. Um, it's yeah, I don't know if that's a if that's a good enough answer or not. Yeah, I don't know of another diet, honestly, that's been studied um, to have uh, to have uh, inflammation lowering effects. And again, I want to say with Mediterranean, it's just that we know that the end state being cardiovascular disease um, and diabetes and things, we know that those those diseases and those outcomes are lowered. Um, but again, I don't know that we would call Mediterranean diet an anti-inflammatory diet either. It's just there's certain foods in that diet that tend to have some benefits for inflammation. Very good point. Yeah. I know I would have thought that, oh, I'm on the Mediterranean diet. It's going to, you know, I wish there was all my inflammation. I, I wish there was an anti-inflammatory diet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we would not take any medications or anything. Yeah. <laughs> so our next question from Ellen is, how do you know how much energy you have to counter calories? Um, try to uh, say that question again to me. No, how do you, I think she's trying to ask how, how do you know how much energy you have to counter calories? So I guess it's how many calorie, you know, so you don't get sluggish or, um, to keep your energy going. What's the, maybe it's the minimal amount of calories, perhaps. How do you, so how do you know how much you need to eat in order to yeah. not get like feel deprived feel? Yeah. Right. So yeah. Yeah, again, some of this is, again, it's very individual because some people have a slower metabolism or a higher metabolism, depending on what's going on in your life. If you're fighting an illness, you may have more needs, your energy needs and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think probably the, the best thing would be to, first of all, just take, take stock of how you feel based on how you're eating now. Say, okay, I'm eating like this general pattern for a period of a week. And I know that when I skip breakfast every day, I tend to get super hungry or hangry by like, you know, three or four o'clock. And I tend to, you know, want to hit the wall. Well, then maybe that's a signal that just, you know, you're, you're not eating quite enough earlier in the day. Um, you know, that's just one way of, of, of looking at it. Um, if you want to get really specific, you can go and track what you're eating like that with one of those trackers that I mentioned and actually put all the data in and see the numbers for yourself. And then you'll be able to tell if I eat this much in a day, I feel sluggish. If I eat this much in a day, I feel good. And then you can sort of go up and down and adjust as you need. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Raja, the next question from uh, Leticia is, is there evidence about the effectiveness of intermittent fasting to lose weight and improve your health? Yeah. So intermittent fasting so far um, from those studies that have been done has been shown to be effective for weight loss. The question is, is it more effective for weight loss than anything else, right? We don't think so far, at least we don't have data to show that it is more effective 
than a reduced calorie diet approach. Meaning that, like I mentioned earlier, you figure out I'm eating, you know, this much in a day, probably I'm getting a few extra calories from a can of soda and maybe a Snickers bar, you know, and if I cut those things out, if I cut out the soda and the Snickers bar, you lose some weight. That's what I would call a reduced calorie approach, right? Right. You can do that. You can measure it against intermittent fasting where you're eating in an eight hour window or you're starving one day and you're, I shouldn't say starving, you're fasting one day and you're eating the next day. Um, there's different approaches for intermittent fasting, but you can sort of balance the two and see when we've studied the two approaches together, neither one is superior to the other. Um, now, long-term, we do not, we do not have data yet to show that intermittent fasting is going to necessarily, you know, lower your risk of heart disease, um, you know, or you know, those sorts of things. We, we, we are getting some evidence so far that shows that it can help in controlling insulin resistance and diabetes. And so it may be helpful, but it all comes down to that, that sort of timing of where I said sure. eating, eating less earlier, eating more earlier in the day, eating less later in the day is going to help regulate insulin, which is going to help with weight loss and help with um, metabolism overall. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So you spoke a little bit about, um, the, uh, about hormones, but so what are the uh, effects of help, you know, by living healthy mm -hmm. and then long-term on the effects of hormones, you know, like estrogen and things like that, and people have autoimmune issues. Yeah. So talk yeah. a little bit about that, the that, that, that really the importance of living a healthy lifestyle of all the things you actually you spoke about today. Yeah. Yeah. So I can speak, um, I can speak with a little more authority, I would say for female hormones, because it's my, it's one of the areas I focus on in my mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, an example would be somebody that is dealing with irregular menstrual cycles, um, or has, um, you know, polycystic ovary syndrome, which you, know, you may have heard about, but basically different conditions where you're not ovulating every month, you're having some, you know, dysfunction of your estrogen and progesterone. What we know is that if, you know, your you know, weight is in that sort of category where you're finding that you're having a little bit of excess weight compared to your normal baseline. And if you're also having those things happen, that a 5% weight loss, um, you know, and you know, achieving that 5% weight loss by prioritizing some of the foods that I talked about, um, right? Like fruits and vegetables, whole grains, lean proteins, less refined products, less refined sugars, having that sort of a focus and achieving about a 5% weight loss can actually be very effective in, um, in actually helping to bring about regularity of your, uh, theme of your sex hormones. Um, and this actually applies both for men and for women. So if you're dealing with, you know, uh, increasing your weight over time, and then you notice that your testosterone levels go down for a guy, the same thing might apply that you can actually help to improve your testosterone levels naturally without taking testosterone replacement, just by, you know, eating healthier, and losing a little bit of weight. And it's the same thing for females. But for autoimmune disease, um, I think the thing behind that is understanding the rule of microinflammation and stress. Um, and so I think the, if you want to take it sort of holistically, probably again, the incorporation of overall healthy foods is only going to be helpful. The incorporation of movement is only going to be helpful because we know these things again, just overall tend to cut down on the stress hormone levels in the body, which may lower inflammation, but I can't say, you know, that we have this one, you know, huge meta-analysis of studies that says for lupus, for example, you know, you eat this particular thing and it's yep. going to be the answer. I think the same general approach uh, applies across the board to lower inflammation. Yep. Good information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You just have a, about a minute, but I um, wanted to ask, um, are women of color more likely to be vitamin D deficient and living in the Northern hemisphere? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Women of color, including myself, um, those of us who have a little bit of melanin in our skin, uh, we have a harder time converting the vitamin D that comes from the sun into the um, active form that our bodies use and need. Um, and so, yes, we do tend to be more at risk of vitamin D um, deficiency. Um, and so what's the big deal with it? Um, we're learning more and more about vitamin D. There's lots of lots of studies that are being done on it. A lot of the data we have is more associational or observational data, seeing that when people's vitamin D levels are low, it seems that maybe their you know, immune system function is a little bit lower, They're, they may have more mood issues, fatigue issues, things like that. Right. So I, yeah, so I would say if you struggle with those issues and you're a person of color, 
you know, or if you're not a person of color and you struggle with those issues, it's not a bad mm-hmm. thing to talk to your doctor about checking your level and figuring out if you need a supplement. Yeah, exactly. But maybe take some vitamin D. Mm-hmm. Anyway, listen, I wish we could continue on. It looks like we, we've run out of time. So mm-hmm. I would like to thank Dr. Raja and all of you for joining us this evening. And Dr. Raja has graciously agreed to try to respond to any unanswered questions you may have asked during this evening. In a couple of weeks, we'll respond to the emails um, which you'll receive. You will also find relevant articles available on our website. If you've enjoyed tonight's discussion, please check out our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash women's journey to watch for announcements about future conversations, podcasts, and special programs brought to you by A Woman's Journey. In the meantime, we hope you will find our monthly email informative and engaging. Conversations That Matter is brought to you in part through a non-restrictive educational grant from Bristol Myers Squibb. Good night and stay well. Right. Thank you. Thank you.